It's time now to make Coors Light last call. Tonight, a special one-on-one -on -one with Brett the Hitman Hart. It is now one year since his brother Owen Hart died in a tragic fall in Kansas City. Tonight, Bret Hart talks about the accident, who's to blame, and his own future in professional wrestling. Coors Light Last Call is brought to you by Coors Light, the call of the Rockies. And by WestJet Airlines. Low fares today, tomorrow, everywhere we fly. Hello and welcome to this very special edition of Last Call. This Tuesday will mark the one-year anniversary of the death of Owen Hart. Tonight, for the first time, his brother, Brett the Hitman Hart, openly talks about the accident that changed everything. Where is your heart, where's your, where your head from a year ago? Well, I have a lot of problems with it. I, I, um, I, it's, it's really hard. It's been really hard, I think, from, you know, I don't think there's a day that doesn't go by that I don't think about it a, a hundred times. It's been really hard on my father, and it's been exceptionally hard on my mother. And I don't doubt that it's been a real strain on every single member of the family, and everyone, I can say with some happiness anyway, that I got to spend some of the best time with Owen, flying on planes, traveling with them in the dressing room. And I got a lot more of them, I suppose, than some of my other brothers and sisters did in the last few years, and I'm grateful for the time I had with them. And you went to Tokyo, and you were in uh, India. You were at the Taj Mahal yeah. together. There were a lot of places. You... Yeah. Is there one memory that, that you hold on to closer than any other one? Um, well, there's a funny one. As I remember, we were just getting ready to the, the big, ang like, the angle in wrestling where we were <laughs> fighting each yeah. other. And he was pretty nervous, you know. It's like I, he was really worried that, uh, you know, it wasn't, you know, he really wanted to do well. This is the first time they really threw him a nice, uh, yeah. nice ball to run with kind of thing. And I had known some friends in Hawaii, and they picked us up, and they took us out in a little motorboat, like a little, little boat or something anyway that we fit in. And they drove us around, they're scooting around, and he was like, we were supposed to be kayfabe, like no one's supposed to know we're together, baseball hat and glasses and stuff, and we're, <laughs> we're having a great time. And I remember the guy says, I'll take you one last run out to the thing, like uh, to the, they wanted to take us, I guess, where the ocean drops, yeah. I guess, kind of thing. And we went out, and it ran out of gas. And I thought it was so funny, and we were talking about, we have seen something like this on an episode on The Simpsons, which yeah. we were both, Owen yeah. and I were both fans of The Simpsons. <laughs> and Owen kept thinking I was ribbing him. And I'm going, I'm not ribbing you. And then we started getting really sunburned because we just got off the plane kind yeah. of thing and this was happening. And then I started, we kept drifting out. And sure. We got kind of scared and I was laughing about it. And I can remember, I was thinking, can imagine if we kept going out until all of a sudden it's like we're gone five, six, seven, eight days and finally the helicopters <laughs> and the camera crews and they finally find us and they rescue us <laughs> and we got the stubble and all that. And it's like, I just remember thinking like, no, we still hate each other. You know, we're not friends and the cameras and all that. I just thought it'd be such a funny thing. And we laughed. I laughed about it. He didn't find it funny at all till till that. one of the guys actually swam in and swam to shore and got someone to save us, kind of thing. But well, if, they, if he'd seen Gilligan's Island, maybe you know he would have appreciated it. You know, I just thought it was so funny to picture these cameramen and yeah. everything getting the big scoop. Like, do you really hate each other? You know, are you friends now? It's like, yeah, we're friends. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, so much for the angle. You know, but. I miss him. He yeah. was a great. He had a great sense of humor, my brother Owen. He was, he was so funny, and you had to be around him. He, he was like a chess player. He was three or four steps ahead of all the practical jokes, and you never thought it was like. You could, I don't know if he could, you, if you could think he could get you, but he could always get you. He pulled one prank on my dad, where he, uh, he disguised his voice from the lobby. He did this to everybody. He was great at a master at disguising a voice, and he called up, and he was this old wrestler. First, he was real friendly with Stu, and I'm with my dad in the room, and he was. Uh, Dad's pacing around, like talking to him about old matches and this and that, and and then Owen starts getting kind of belligerent, you know, about how he could have took my dad, and my dad never really was as tough as he thought he was, and, <laughs> and then I see my dad kind of changing the tone, you know, he's pacing around, and uh, I listened to him at first; he had been real friendly, and that's about three minutes later I hear my dad going, "Reg, if you'd wanted to try me, why didn't you try me?" and all that. He got all worked up, and I remember, and then I saw my dad; he just slammed the phone down. He stood, and he had a big smile on his face, and he goes. A lousy Owen got me. You know, and I just, it, was, it was classy. He did that to so many guys. And you do do pretty good. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I think, you know, I was to say, my, my brother Wayne does a pretty good impression. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, you, if you knew his father, Stu, I mean, you'd appreciate this invitation uh, as, as good as it is. Um, you also called your brother uh, the finest family man that you'd ever met. Yeah. Yeah, you, know, you need to make sure that it's always acknowledged or understood that Owen wasn't like a lot of these wrestlers that have died from, uh, you know, overdose of pills or drugs or were, were 
sleazy kind of guys or yeah. um, he was never like that. He was, uh, he was, after he was done his match, he was in bed at 10, 10 30, 11 o'clock every day. He was straight to his room, he'd call home, he'd never, he, he was so devoted to his family. I can almost, and I always had a lot of bags. I always had two or three bags with, filled with hitman outfits and stuff. I could never just race through um, the customs and immigration kind of thing like Owen did. But he literally, when we landed in Calgary, and you, sometimes we'd catch these early, we tried so hard to get home as fast as we could. We always lived the furthest of all the wrestlers, I think. And we'd land in Calgary Airport, and we, he'd be like, like almost like a starting gate. He'd have two little bags. He packed everything. He packed the world into these two little bags. And as soon as that door opened, he was gone. He'd race and he'd run right through the, the through customs and over like until he was with his family. Uh, my best memory of, of Owen uh, was when we were working together in Calgary in the early '80s, and he was just a kid, skinny little kid. And I can remember after we were finished uh, taping. Uh, in the parking lot, and those saucer eyes looking up to his big brother, and we were going off someplace that he couldn't <laughs> come along, and it was like a little puppy dog. So it's like, but you could just see that his hero was you, and that's the memory that I will always have of Owen Hart. Because well, uh, he, you were his hero, and you know. Uh, that. I had I had a lot to do with um, Owen as a kid. I think I, I without realizing, he told me this himself. Uh, he, I was the one that put his shoes on. Yeah. I was the one that Owen, get over here. You know, yeah. stand here, no move. You know, like, and I didn't realize I was, but that was like something that was always designated from one big brother to another. I think. Sure. And I, I've always been very proud of how he turned out, and uh, I think he really did listen to me and followed me. And, uh, you know, again, I, I, I've always felt that if I had just been with that company, and I, I if I'd never been screwed over and, and forced to leave, and made to leave. Uh, that if I'd been there in that company and when he came to me like he always did and said, hey, they got this really crazy idea where they want me to, I would have said, you're not doing that. You are not doing anything like that. And I would have shot that down and it would never have happened. And he would be alive today if that, if I was still working for that company. I, I know that with a, I can say that with, with such, you know, I'm so sure of it. And it just bothers me that I wasn't there to look out for him that day. Do you blame? Vince McMahon for the death of your brother. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I mean he's solely accountable. I mean, did Vince McMahon drag him up there and, and fasten him? No, he didn't do that. But he hired these people that were obviously pretty sh shoddy experts. Um, he he's definitely responsible. And and what happened to my brother was not necessary. He was never a stunt man. He, he never had any experience doing that. And unfortunately in wrestling, and I'm a living proof of it, it's you do what you're told or you suffer the consequences, which means they may destroy your character, they'll have you in such uh, awful storylines and uh, in situations as a, that, you're, that you really go, maybe I better do it. And, I, and I'm sure that was a, very close to the truth, but definitely, positively, uh, he's responsible for the negligence of my brother's death. The family of Owen Hart have filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the World Wrestling Federation. It will go to trial in February. When we come back, Brett the Hitman Hart talks about retirement. Right now, it's time for the Coors Light Talking Fan. The question this week is, has wrestling gone too far? Here's what you had to say. Yeah, when people start to die, maybe that's a bit far. It's violent, but it's not that violent, but still, the attitudes are kind of crazy. A little too far, yeah. I watched it years ago, and I really liked it, but it's not the same anymore. Welcome back to the show. Brett the Hitman Hart has been in professional wrestling for 22 years. However, he has not fought since he suffered a concussion two months ago. Tonight, for the first time, he talks about retirement. If you had a TV set and you plugged it in with a long extension cord and you were walking across a room and you tripped and you dropped it about four or five times, that's what I feel like my, my brain has been like. And uh, I don't want to be like Muhammad Ali someday. I don't want to be uh, unable to remember or recall the things that I saw and did and the people and the countries. And like the most, most important, worth more than money or anything is, is your, your health and your brain. And I, I, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if Eric Lindros' career is over. Uh, judging by the sound of it, because I'm worried only, and I say that only in sense of knowing how bad mine has been. And I, uh, the thought of right now slipping on ice, or, or even, I'll say even someone like giving you a rear end, just tapping your car, and sure. you know, any kind of impact or a blow kind of is terrifying for me right now. I, the thought of even, 
in wrestling, someone me, give me a flying head mare or something would be a really dangerous thing. I don't know that I could do it. I, I, I'll, I'll wait and see. But if I do, my health will be the first. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go back and wrestle if I'm not safe. And, uh, but at 41, 42, 42 now. Look, 41. No. I know. <laughs> I was going to say 40, but okay, 42. Um, at 40, at 42 years of age. Um, even if the doctors come back to you and say, yeah, you're okay. Well, then I might look at it strictly for a very sh I, I, I'm really pretty much maybe pretty close to the end of the road. I don't That's know. That's what I'm saying. I mean, how much more is there to get? Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 uh, what I will say is I didn't really want to end it on a... Like, I, I felt like quitting when my brother Owen passed away. Sure. And uh, I even decided initially in the beginning that that I was gonna walk I, I could never go back how can you make any kind of a wrestling storyline seem important when you got to deal with the this the reality of this thing yeah, but then as time kind of wore on I thought you know I just hate being you know, having this hang this dark cloud over my head forever because it's I didn't feel it was fair to me and I didn't think it was fair to my fans so I said I'm gonna go back I'm gonna go back and see if I can have one last sort of really fun ride and make it fun for my fans and kind of take that bad taste out and um, now I'm sort of I was doing that and on my way to doing that and then it's all of a sudden it becomes an injury and it's like do I really want to go out on an injury like the that's last we saw him is that he got his head kicked almost right off his shoulders by uh, Bill Goldberg and Starcade and he stumbles around for a couple but that's of weeks. not that's not how they're gonna remember you anyway I mean well, I know you I know you want to I be, wanted that I've you want do you want to be Jordan quest of now that. you now you want to be Michael Jordan hit the last shot in the last game you want to be Elway walking off the Super Bowl with the trophy in his hands but I would but like I, uh, or something you know, maybe, maybe Gretzky. You, you, well, around even maybe just something, uh, but not an injury. Okay. Uh, maybe a farewell tour. I'd love to. Have, I, I feel so bad that Chris Benoit's not with the company I'm with anymore because yeah. he was he was to me was one of the last real great wrestlers. You know, a real wrestler that can no gimmicks. No, he was a wrestler, and I love that at him, and I'm, I miss him, and I hope he does well in the other company. But you know, I would love to have had one last uh, farewell tour of just matches with him. For example, um, you know something like that. But I, I, at this point, maybe there's someone else that will fill that void, and maybe it could be somebody else. But I really don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty worried about whether I'll ever go back. And uh, I, I'd, I'd hate to say one way or the other that uh, I'm not going back. Or I just know that I've made it. And I told the doctor, I said my health is first, and uh, I'm not going to go back if there's, if there's a chance of more damage. Uh, and I have done a lot in wrestling. Maybe there's not a whole lot left for me to do, and uh, I'm not sure what the role the WCW will have for me, you know, when, when this thing lifts, if it ever does. A lot of people don't know this about you, but you went to Mount Royal College, right? Yeah. When you were late teens? Yeah. Say, so is this, say, so we dig this stuff me. up. Yeah, okay. Scare me, Dave. So, <laughs> you, you studied film. Yeah. And I read somewhere that you would like to do a movie. Yeah. Now, do you see yourself becoming a movie star per se, the, the, what Hogan's doing, Howie Long is doing it. Um, no, nah, really, you know, I think I was a decent actor, and I, I, I wouldn't be. You've, surprised you've if done I, some, but I, mean, I did two seasons Lonesome Dove. But I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm destined to be the, a great actor. Maybe I was a good actor, and maybe maybe I'll find out that I was a, a, you were incredible. You know, I never really had the chance to, to explore all that. But more than that, I think my real heart is is, is to, to to get behind the camera and make movies and bring that out of other people. But you know that, that the producers will, will say just the opposite. I mean, trust me, if you think Vince McMahon is tough, you haven't seen the boys in, oh, in L.A. They're just getting me out in front of the camera. Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, because that's my that, arm, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I, I could be an action hero if I came along and somebody said, no, we really got some. Uh, I, the one thing I've been careful about in the, in, the, in the movie or film business is that I, you know, I did one episode of Sinbad, which wasn't a bad show or anything, but I realized that it's too... It wasn't based on any kind of reality, and this is a sort of fairyland. Yeah, that. sure. And I regretted doing that, and and uh, and I actually changed management in in that decision because I didn't want to I didn't want to do B movies like Roddy Piper did, and I didn't want to do all these. I don't we'll just do anything. So I don't I don't have this burning desire to do anything. So I'm on camera. Uh, the Lonesome Dove was really special to me because it was um, it was a drama and it was old west, and I could sink my teeth into something like that, and it was very real. Uh, I did a little bit of, so I did some mad TV stuff, which I thought, well, okay. I'll see, try the humor out a little bit. Yeah. And I, I think I have a pretty good sense of humor if you get to know me. Uh, that doesn't always come out or it's not always so transparent, but I have a, a fairly sly sense of humor.
Yeah. So I enjoyed the Mad TV stuff. I thought it was excellent, and the whole crew was great. Uh, Will Souths and all those guys was an absolute riot, and both times I did the show. So I always think there's, there's ranges of stuff I might be good at, but, uh, you know, and, but acting's a hard life. You know, there's a lot too many people think, like, all oh, those actors have it so easy. Acting is a grind. It's very tough. Uh, long days, long days on the set. Uh, it's hard work. Uh, they earn everything they, they make. They deserve these big actors, I think. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of respect for the acting people. It's, it's, it's no easy job, and not everybody can do it like they think they can. First time I saw you portrayed in a cartoon setting was on The Simpsons. Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah, I loved it. It's one of the highlights yeah. of my... Uh, <laughs> Great. I mean, you've really made it, isn't it? When, yeah. when you are now a Simpson. The, the, the things that I've really set up, like, geez, I really made it were, were when uh, the, 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 my very first action figure was a big thing to me. I couldn't believe it. Like, I've really made a toy, you know? <laughs> uh, my first card, wrestling card, yeah. was a really big thing to me. Because, uh, again, it's always, you always identify it from being a little kid. Um, I got drawn in uh, Mad Magazine one time. You know, they had a scene out of that Untouchable movie where... Um, I guess somebody got hit with a baseball bat. Well, this yeah. was a scene based on Honky Tonk Man hitting me over the head with a guitar and splatting <laughs> my head all over that. I thought it was so damn funny. And I've always read Mad Magazine and then bought it and was a big kind of fan for it. And it was funny to eventually even yeah. do Mad TV. But uh, those things and, and The Simpsons. When I made The Simpsons, I always think of Tony Curtis on The Flintstones. It's like, uh, I'll take Simpsons and I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, you know, they'll never take that away from me anyway, Vince McMahon. Time now for a little trash talk. Ric Flair has this to say about Bret Hart, quote, Bret Hart is the best there is, the best there was, the best there'll ever be. And that's the truth. Trash Talk brought to you by Noise Media. Now that you've got the internet, it's time to make some noise. We'll be right back. Welcome back to this special edition of Coors Light Last Call. One-on-one -on -one with Bret the Hitman Hart. I look back at the, di at the days that you and I spent in Calgary. And the Stampede Wrestling, for those people who don't and didn't see it, I actually got into this doing play-by-play. -play, yeah. and, that's, and that's where we first got to know each other. And there was, as you said, a, an, almost a sense of family with it. And there is, maybe it's a sense of innocence. And maybe it's just 20 years ago that we choose to remember what we want to remember. But uh, there, it, it, to me, it was a lot more fun than it is right now. I know it's a lot bigger now, but yeah. it seemed to be a lot more fun. And when I go back to when I was a little kid, being a kid watching wrestling, I, I felt when I was a wrestler years later doing it that I brought that same element back that if I, and I've always felt that if I was a fan of wrestling, I would have watched Bret Hart all the time. I remember Dave Rule. Yeah, Dave Sweet Daddy Rule, Seeky. Sweet Daddy Seeky. Sure. Tying the pig's head around. <laughs> uh, he pinned that pig's tail on Dave Rule's back of his trunks and Dave didn't know. And I just think it was, so, he's so damn humiliating, that Sweet Daddy Seeky, who I uh, was always one of my heroes as a wrestler, as a villain, you know, but I loved it back then. Yeah. It was very simple and it was no, you certainly didn't have to uh, do any real high-risk things. Uh, it, it was, it was, it was. I, I loved it much better back then. I really did. But Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan was always will be, you know. And I know everyone says this, but it really is true, especially if you really know him. He's the Elvis Presley of wrestling. Uh, he says this about you: "Quote, Bret Hart still makes me believe that wrestling is good." Well, that's a great compliment. Uh, you know, I. I read some of those quotes, you know, and you, you, you know, when you get the book, I, I looked at the book and I read it through and it was really, I never really stopped to, to, to acknowledge those little comments on the back. And it was just a few days ago that I was kind of like holding up and I <laughs> kind of looked at it and I thought, yeah. every one of those uh, little quotes on the back is a, is a very, um, uh, they're all really great things that, 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 that all those guys said about me. You won your first championship at 15 years of age. I told you I did my homework before yeah, we started did. this. From then till now, what is the one thing in your career that you are most proud of? Uh, wow, that you're, you're right. My the very first, I can remember I came, I, I had uh, the city wrestling championships in Calgary high school wrestling. Yeah. And nobody thought I would win. You know, no, I, I remember my dad even kind of, kind of gave me a nice pep talk, but kind of wished me the best. And I don't, just didn't get the impression that anyone really, they were bracing me for the worst kind of thing. And uh, I, I wrestled my heart out and I won the city wrestling championships that, that day. And, and uh, for me, as a kid, it, I hadn't really accomplished anything. I, mean, I, was, I, did, I was well on my way to being a complete failure, everything. <laughs> and I won that city wrestling championships. And I can remember, um, 
you know, my brother gave me a ride, and we saw my dad at a gas station. He was getting ready to go to Edmonton. This was on a Saturday for the Stampede Wrestling thing, and he was filling up at the, at the gas station. I pulled in, and he, he, he goes, how did you do? And I remember I opened up my hand, and I showed him the medal. And my whole life changed from that point. I had a different confidence. My whole relationship with my father was he was... My dad became so... Um, yeah. Almost obsessed with how... You know, he wanted me in the Olympics right then and there, and that was his dream. And I never did really follow through with the amateur wrestling, and, but I always had respect for, for it. And I, I love what I accomplished in it. And that little medal that I have at home uh, is worth more to me <clears throat> than all the uh, wrestling belts. You can melt them all down, and that one medal is always, it's still, I, I, I got that locked away. The book is called Brett Hitman Hart, The Best There Is, The Best There Was, The Best That There Ever Will Be. It's on sale right now. Brett, thanks so much. Thank you, Dave. Thanks. We'll be back with the end of the story right after this. Coors Light Last Call is brought to you by Coors Light, the call of the Rockies. And by WestJet Airlines. Low fares today, tomorrow, everywhere we fly. The end of the story is brought to you by Boston Pizza. You'll find more than 100 delicious dishes served at Boston Pizza. Come and get it all. Joe DiMaggio once explained why he worked so hard every day of his career. DiMaggio said, there's always some kid who maybe see me for the first time. I owe him my best. That quote always seems to remind me of Brett and Owen Hart. Maybe because we all grew up in Alberta, but there's just something about honest people who carry with them a work ethic. The big money that's now a part of professional sports has a nasty habit of spoiling the good. But for some reason, it never affected Owen Hart. Perhaps that's why the tragic accident that claimed his life a year ago touched so many people. Owen Hart was a good man with a good heart. He loved his family and he cared about his friends. As you grow older in this life, you learn to accept those things that you cannot change. It's a tough lesson to learn, especially now. For those that knew Owen Hart, it's going to take a whole lot more than just a year to accept what for most of us is still a loss that is completely unacceptable. And that's the end of the story.